Now I've done it. Uh, any advice? I've been, oh, I've been taken over. Can we reverse? Yes. Stop it. So we assume that going all the way from the moment uh, Genevieve's granddaughter was born and decided she wanted to be a doctor, <laughs> all the way up to retirement, that it's a smooth, linked process in which we're building competencies in order to become master physicians at the bedside. We assume that what we're teaching before medical school links nicely to what we teach in medical school and so on. I would argue that in the United States and probably uh, throughout the world, it's more like a series of boxes. And that what happens in the box is relatively isolated from the doctor we want to have in the clinic and in the bedside. In fact, I would argue that we have created structures within our nations that cause this division and in the United States the structures look like this. These are all the bodies that accredit medical education programs, that assess doctors along the continuum, that certify them, that give them licenses, that provide continuing education. And the end result of this is not a true continuum, but it's a great deal of fragmentation. What I think is happening globally is we need a tool to close the gaps and close the seams. And that brings me to my second point, which is I believe all the work we are all doing on competencies is the tool that will close the gap because competencies apply across the continuum. So I think the seams will be closed if we can all emphasize competencies, but every country is developing its own competencies. Uh, within the last two years, a group at my organization looked at every competency system they could find from around the globe. They found 153 systems that they could adequately translate and compare. And interestingly, this was an article from Academic Medicine. You can get it online. Interestingly, they found that those 153 systems, in the end, boiled down to a much smaller number, roughly 58 competencies. But more importantly, those competencies reduced to eight domains. Eight domains which match very closely with the competency system our neighbors in Canada have done and those we've seen in many other countries. So six of these were the original domains that our Council on Graduate Medical Education developed. We've added these two on interprofessional collaboration and personal and professional development. But we now believe that any system in the world of competencies really can be mapped, matched to these eight key domains that we're all trying to develop in the good doctor. So the second point is competencies can be the tool for us to complete the continuum and we can use that tool in different ways. In the United States we use the tool to identify the observable behaviors the things we should be able to see in a graduating medical student on day one of their residency. And more and more of our schools now are applying this. They will not let somebody get the medical doctor degree and become a resident unless they can show 13 core and trustable professional activities. That's the web link if you're interested in looking at what those 13 competencies are. C-E-P-A-E-R stands for Core and Trustable Professional Activities for Entering Residency. 
The third factor has been alluded to in earlier presentations, including at the ceremony yesterday, and that's that you cannot change the education system and put our graduates into a dysfunctional health care system. We have to be changing both simultaneously in our countries. You know the United States is struggling with changing its health care system, but we're trying. We're trying very hard because we need to have alignment between our educational enterprise and the health care system. And I know many of the, the uh, states in Mexico are working on this even as we speak. The third point, which has been alluded to already, is the nature of interprofessional teams. I don't know about your nation, but in the United States, we have educated nurses in isolation from doctors, in isolation from pharmacists, and then we throw them in a hospital and expect them to be a team. What we've realized is that there are core competencies to work as a team. <clears throat> and finally, in the United States, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, public health, all have come together. And we've defined, on the left-hand side, what we think are the core competencies for interprofessional teams. And more and more schools are mounting curricula. That document is available on our website as well as all the other health professions websites. And last but not least, because of the nature of this meeting, because of all the exhibits you see outside, is the real power of technology. Our first speaker this morning talked about simulation and, and the great power it brings. And I've noticed that most of the exhibitors are focused on simulation. But I would just simply stress that while that's a very powerful learning tool, I think the ability to access data on the World Wide Web is really our most powerful technology. Four years ago, I visited Tanzania. And they were begging us to send them textbooks of medicine because they didn't have those. Today, the medical schools in sub-Saharan Africa increasingly have broadband internet access. And what we find, this is MedEd Portal, which is on the AAMC's website. And it is a repository. It's a library, online library, of peer-reviewed curricular materials. What we've been gratified to see is access to that website is coming as much from countries outside the United States as inside the United States. So I would argue that the globalization we seek really is happening, and it's happening because in one way or another, all of us are working in these five key areas. And the more we talk about and share our experiences, the more we really will achieve true globalization. Thank you.